very much. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, so I'm a psychologist and currently doing my PhD in this project and uh, I'm very interested in synchrony in the autonomic nervous system. But today I was asked to talk about some pros and cons or advantages, what to consider in autonomic nervous system measuring. So um, I'll start with shortly uh, introducing the background and then sharing the design we use in our project. And then we can focus on two psychophysiological measures which have been uh, very prominent. So electrodermal activity, also known as skin conductance, uh, and heart rate variability. And we have some other methods also in our study I can, I can briefly show and uh, possible ideas for education. So, um, in psychophysiology we have this basic assumption that all these emotional behavior, social happenings are visible somehow in our physiology. And sometimes we forget that there is always this bidirectionality between our bodily feelings and cognitive thoughts. So this left picture here could represent, uh, let's say, stress, chronic stress, um, which is a mental state, but it affects the body, so um, your immune system functions differently, you get sick more easily, stay sick for a longer period of time. And uh, the other way around, we can take, for example, the blood sugar level, which is a bodily state, but if the blood sugar level drops very low, uh, we have some mental effects, such as uh, irritation, and uh, if it goes on for long, we have trouble concentrating. Uh, and at least in clinical psychology and psychiatry, they primarily use these top-down models uh, focusing on emotions and the body's role is kind of maybe minimized in these theories. So we, in our, our project, we are very prominent um, uh, uh, considering that the body is very important in our, in our lives also. The ANS is also called the involuntary nervous system, um, so we have quite little control over it. Maybe with some biofeedback we can learn how to control our breathing and, and affect somehow the process. Uh, but the idea is to maintain the balance in our bodies. You've probably heard of this fight or flight. Uh, response or reflex, which is about the sympathetic nervous system, we take action, and then uh, the parasympathetic part is uh, active in relaxation and recovery. And previously these were thought to be antagonists, so working either the sympathetic or parasympathetic is active, but nowadays it is known that they can be equally active. So this is the background, and um, here you can see our lovely campus in Haid, Finland. <laughs> so Jyväskylä in, in central Finland. Uh, our project, briefly, the relational mind, uh, like was mentioned, is funded by the Academy of Finland and belongs to this larger program on human mind. Our PI is Professor Jaakko Seikkula and Virgilis Kukuri and myself are working full time with this project. So I've done all the measurement, measurement sessions and uh, collected the data and analyzed that. And we also have some European partners also in the UK. Um, so the idea is that the mind is not just in the brain. It's in our body, it's in the body, and it also takes place in relationships. So between people, it's not just in me, but it builds in, in relationships. Now we study couple therapy, so it's interesting to be here in, in education seminar. Uh, and the way we see it as 
this sort of natural laboratory to study attunement and, and synchrony. So we use many, many different levels to study. Uh, we use the speech, what the people are uh, speaking. Then we have the, all the bodily movements, synchrony in those. Uh, then we have the ANS activity measured in some sessions and then also the thoughts and feelings we did not share aloud so they are asked in an interview. Uh, and here is uh, my, my design. I have great visual skills as you can see. <laughs> so um, each uh, session is video recorded. We have two clients, the couple and then two therapists. And this is the video recording is a is a standard procedure in our clinic because it's um, the psychotherapy research and training center. So we have four cameras, each one uh, one for each participant's face, and then for the whole setting a split screen recording. And then we have these two measuring sessions uh, at the end, uh, or quite at the beginning of the therapy process, the second session, and then towards the end, usually about six uh, session. And then we have the equipment. Also, therapists wear the equipment, so that's something that has not been so often done in therapy research. Then one of the uh, an interviewer, not one of the therapists, selects four uh, video extracts from the therapy session to be shown later, within one day during the stimulated recall interview. And the interviewer's basic question is, what thoughts, feelings or body sensations did you have at that time of the session? So people come individually to this interview. And we also use some forms to monitor how the therapy process is going on and, all, of course, all the background uh, knowledge we need from the participants. These are the measures we're using. So, first beat, the heart rate monitor by first beat, uh, two electrodes, and it's fastened to the chest. It stays there. And we actually use this for three days, so we also get the baseline heart rate activity. Then the electrodermal activity, which is measured from the non-dominant palm. Uh, often it's used in fingertips, but we chose the palm because in therapy they're not uh, that restricted, so um, if they move their fingers a bit, it doesn't um, bother so much. Then a uh, respiration belt, also a fabric belt, which uh, stretches based on breathing, is used during therapy. In interviews, we have also the finger pulse volume, and then a neck microphone, uh, just to see when the person is speaking or not, the, the muscle activation. So now, uh, we're focusing here, I'm focusing on this heart rate and electrodermal part. And if we start with this electrodermal uh, part, how many of you are familiar with skin conduction? Yeah, so. Uh, basically, previously used term was GSR, galvanic skin uh, response or reflex. That's not recommended anymore, so please use EDA. Uh, these are kind of like synonyms, but uh, the EDA is a larger term, and, and skin conductance is the specific uh, method we're using. So there is conductance in our skin. It varies depending on how much sweat we have on the skin. And this is only controlled by the sympathetic nervous system. So we can use this as an indication of the level of arousal, how alert you are. Of course, concerning psychology, it's uh, interesting that almost all emotions produce something in EDA. 
often it's an increase, but there are some exceptions. Then synchrony in skin conductance has been connected to empathy. There's some re research about that. But maybe more uh, about the primitive type, not so much the cognitive type of empathy. And there's also a hypothesis of uh, emotional reactivity connected to, to good synchrony. Uh, the picture down below is from our actual data showing a very nice skin conductance response. So the skin conductance, it has slower tonic changes and then uh, more quick phasic uh, changes or responses. And when a stimulus appears, the response uh, starts about one or two seconds after it, uh, which is quite slow compared to some uh, brain imaging research or like that. The peak is about 4 seconds and we turn to 50% baseline most often in 4 to 8 seconds. So that's a response and if you look at this, this is um, an actual measuring session we've had 90 minutes and you can see the raw skin conductance of each participant. So we have uh, the female client Heli, male client Lasse, not your Lasse, someone else, uh, and uh, therapist one, therapist two. Uh, so, for example, you can connect this to dialogue. Here is the male client's highest skin conductance peak of the session. Ignore this, this is where they are already taking the equipment. So we can connect what was happening here, and you can see also with Heli, there's a very uh, big increase in her uh, level of arousal. And it was actually when therapist asked Lassa, what would you answer to your late grandmother if she was here talking to you? And he becomes very emotional and cannot really say anything. And again, he has a reaction when uh, his spouse says, well, I was thinking that he's after all like a grown up man and a father, he should probably get over this sorrow and um, so on, so he, he has a reaction there. So this is one way to connect observations. I'm not really going into this in, in detail, but if you're interested in synchrony, I really recommend you to check these. Uh, references here. I've used these to modify, modified these to study uh, synchrony also in a four-person setting. This is mainly being used only in dyadic settings. And what is the concordance index? It's really a value of the from the whole measuring, so one index of the synchrony during that whole time. And you can use uh, Time lag, so you can move the other signal, see what is the best time lag for this uh, synchrony. So, who is following who in a way? And what I consider important in this type of time series research and, and correlation and synchrony is the autocorrelation problem. So, uh, what you need some kind of measure to uh, assess the chance level synchrony, and what we use is this. Monte Carlo shuffling. Uh, so here, the green uh, bold line is uh, the therapist synchrony to therapists, which is quite nice, good synchrony. And then the uh, equivalent uh, narrow green line here is showing the chance level synchrony. So now we know this is not just a quick coincidence. And uh, this is from a paper I, I just submitted. And the result was actually that the two therapists have the highest synchrony and the couples who are distressed one in couple therapy, they have the lowest synchrony. So that was quite unexpected because if you're romantically involved and have lived uh, together with your spouse for a long time, we assumed that there would be higher synchrony. There has been, at least in cortisol levels, this type of phenomenon. But maybe it's the role and the education of the therapist that makes the 
producing. Okay, so why should you use schema conductors? It's very easy to use and to implement in different research designs. It's quite cheap. Maybe the amplifier is the most costly part. And it's still the most popular method for investigating these, these phenomena. Since 2013, we're still on the increase in clinical applications also. So when the skin impactance rises, the person is more alert. When it decreases, the person is less alert. Of course, there is a lot of buts always. What to consider, long list. So, uh, skin conductance is dependent on and reacts to many factors of age and sex, room temperature, time of day, medication, and so on. Also, prior physical exercise. So, these are all things you have to ask of your participants. And then we have an individual level of skin conductance. If you do between subject comparisons, you have to take that into account you're studying the overall level. So it's a bit easier maybe to do within subject comparisons because usually you measure about two minutes of baseline. In conduction, you can compare that to or, or make a stimuli response uh, comparisons. And like uh, someone just said, <laughs> it does not tell the, the specific emotion. So you always need to connect it to at least the video recording and assess. Um, so, for example, happy excitement and anxiety can both increase EDA. Uh, I don't know, maybe in education it's different, but at least in our research we don't really wish for these sort of uh, startled responses or orienting responses. So you should really consider uh, this issue if it's the certain thing X which causes the reaction or that it's such a new thing, it's very surprising and that's why it causes something. And participants have to stay quite still. That's one issue. So that was the skin conductance part. Now, moving on to heart rate. Skin conductance was only synthetic. Now, heart is innervated both by sympathetic and parasympathetic branches. But in rest, it's mostly this vagal parasympathetic influence. And the most often used measure is the heart rate variability nowadays. So, the lower picture there shows the heartbeats, and you can see that the time interval between them varies a bit. That's in milliseconds. So actually it's good that there is variability because high heart rate variability is connected to good physical fitness, relaxation, recovery. And when it's low, then it's connected to stress, anxiety, exertion. So there are many methods. Maybe the most widely used are time domain and frequency domain methods. Time domain could be, for example, the root mean square of successive differences in heart rate variability. And with frequencies, you have high frequency heart rate, which is just the parasympathetic uh, part. You have low frequency, very low frequency, but most often high frequency heart rate is to study. In the future, there might be these non-linear methods approaching. This is not, uh, the example is not um, heart rate variability, but it's used actually in this calculation just to show this sort of stress vector. It takes into account heart rate, heart rate variability, high frequency, low frequency, respiratory variables connected to heart rate. And uh, this is from our pilot case where we only had one client and one therapist and one student. And you can see the highest <coughs> stress for this female client. Now, she was crying in the session, emotional. 
What was interesting that in the stimulant recall interview, she did not remember this very stressful moment. So, um, she says, I remember nothing, but now that I see, I remember I was crying, I don't remember what happened there. Quite interesting concerning how learning happens or how the consolidation of, of memories happen and uh, also concerning arousal levels. So what is the optimal arousal level? Um, this was not clearly appropriate for um, for a longer period of time to continue. Maybe you need uh, moments like these for a shorter period of time in therapy. Okay, so also this one is a very popular measure. Extensively studied sports sciences, medicine, occupational health. And I would consider this especially useful when studying stress. Also this emotional strain. Or then recovery. It has been connected to high, high variability, has been connected to resilience to outside demands. It's also quite sensitive. And then you have this that nowadays these wireless devices are becoming more cheap, of course. They're very unobtrusive and people can move freely. But what you should really consider if you use the wireless devices is how to synchronize the data with video. We have noticed that the monitor's own clock can differ in seconds or even minutes, even though you synchronize the, the clock before the measurement. One other important thing is how accurately you want to connect this uh, HRV to, to your phenomena. So you need, need at least 30 seconds, most often one minute or five minutes for the calculation. With rapid skin conductance, you have to take into account physical fitness level, medication, everything. And then maybe this is more about medical studies, but if the heart rate variability is low, you have to consider that it may be a result of either decreased parasympathetic activation or increased sympathetic activation. If you're just interested in the stress, it's not such a big problem, but just to be aware of this process. Okay, so other methods we use, we use face reader. Um, it automatically detects emotions from a video recording. So it models the face using 500 key points. It has been trained by 10,000 pictures. And those are ECMA's basic emotions that we use. This is one of our therapists, and you can see that she's, um, according to face reader, she's sad. It shows here also. And there can be um, some emotions almost equally active. So. We use this program, and then um, I noticed someone is talking about this joystick method today, I believe, so not going into this, but um, actually we already saw this effect, windows very similar to this, and we also use this um, negative to positive balance and high to low arousal, so an observer codes uh, continuously using a joystick. Um, what she or he sees from the video. And we have actually correlated the arousal observed by, by an outside uh, uh, observer to the skin conductance and notes that they do correlate, but then there, are mo there can be moments uh, during which only the skin conductance shows a response. So, for example, one man was um, listening to his wife. His wife was very angry and his face was very still and he didn't show much um, high arousal. But then in the skin conductance he had this strong reaction. So he hid the emotion, I believe. So, what is the main value if you consider using this? I think that it makes visible those reactions and experiences which are not talked about or they cannot be observed. 
so people can be unaware, unconscious of them, or, or hide them on purpose. This is the one thing that psychophysiology can do, what, what some other methods cannot. Um, I have to thank Nona Pio, who was brainstorming with me uh, on this because uh, I'm not uh, studying education, so we talked about these different ideas. So one issue is that cognitive side has been dominant in, in educational research, so how is the emotional experience connected to this is one question. Then, of course, you can uh, connect the ANS to different things, learning disabilities or uh, academic emotions we're talked about today, and compare maybe, is this subjective feeling or this so-to-called objective uh, ANS data? Do they tell the same story or do they differ? Then you can, all, of course, monitor the well-being, like we so today with also mobile devices, but also by using heart rate measuring devices. Teachers uh, recovery, stress also with, with students. And then I was thinking, stimulated recall interview, how many have heard about that? Yeah, more people. So it has been used with teachers, but I haven't found any studies in which students would have participated. And what we found is that it's a very powerful in in intervention also. Um, seeing yourself on the video, hearing yourself, how you communicate. Very powerful, enhances reflection, you get new realizations. So how to use that would be um, interesting, at least in my opinion. And um, about the arousal level, maybe I was thinking, um, could teachers be uh, trained to observe these arousal levels, increase, decrease, to enhance learning, uh, like with a female client who did not remember what was talked about during her high stress. So we have this optimal peak uh, learning level, and for some students, High arousal bias, it can, it can be sooner, and lower arousal bias, it's later. But um, yeah, I don't, I don't know what you think, but I don't yet see students wearing these monitors and uh, getting this arousal level throughout the class. But it can be the future, maybe. We can discuss. And finally, I want to mention about a project in education. So uh, this is about in Uvascular, uh, transition from primary school to lower secondary school. And they collect a lot of data, but they also then use the subsample of students uh, which uh, do tasks in an experiment and they use the same uh, ANS equipment I have, I have mentioned here. So this is ongoing now and I, I think Nona was saying that she is using the face reader now to analyze the, the students. Okay, here is one article if you're interested. This is the first we have published in this project. Thank you.